my name is Jean, and I want to take the time to welcome you to my blog, Literarily My Way, using books to engage, teach, connect, and learn. I started this blog because I wanted to share some of my favorite books. Most of my books are within that juvenile works genre. Um, a few of them are not, but most of them are, whether it's from a board book to young adults. And what I want people to see is that children's books don't have to stop when you grow up or when you get older. Just as that little poem and that little saying says, everything I learned, I learned in kindergarten, books are the same way. They bring us in touch. They share messages. They do so many things that we, no matter what our ages are, can learn from, enjoy, cry, it connects. So what I want to do is take you beyond reading. I want you to discover. I want to stimulate your senses. I want to evoke emotions. And I want to inspire connections. All of this while you're reading a book. So in every one of my blogs, I either focus on a book, a theme, could be a person, um, an author, and an illustrator or an illustrator. And every one of them have quotes, some type of images, sometimes they're videos, sometimes they're pictures. Uh, they're also they're always a backstory or a personal connection. Uh, then I also focus on the book. But again, it's not this is not a book report. This is not even a book review. And it definitely is not a book analysis. It's a way to see how you can bring your experiences or create new experiences based on a book. Uh, there also in my book I have ideas of how to engage. Uh, they might be, for example, one of the books or a couple of the books have to do with jazz. Playing some jazz music for yourself or if you're a teacher for the students. Helping students create and learn. Helping them to look at another way of seeing it. Uh, it could be as simple as taking a song when you're teaching a unit on poetry and letting those lyrics be the poet, or taking poetry and turning it into music. Uh, it could be field trips or excursions. It could be so many things. So again, ideas are there. Um, they engage. Ideas for connecting to the real world. And also, sometimes there are extra resources there. So I want you to make sure you take that time and look at it. I want to create you to help create for you a multi-sensory experience. An experience based on episodic memory so that they stay. An interdisciplinary approach. So when you're reading the book, no matter what you read, there's always something else in their history. Math, social studies, language arts, science, art. So much more than what we look at on the surface and how to use those things to help become better readers, to enjoy better, even more than that, to enjoy reading more. So again, I welcome you to Literarily My Way. And today I'm not going to share a certain book or thing. I'm actually going to do my favorite author. That's who I will present. She's my favorite author, illustrator, and her name is Patricia Palacco. Patricia Palacco grew up in Michigan later moved to California, and now lives again in Michigan. She's written about 65 books, and she has a new one coming out this year, 2019, that's called The Bravest Man in the World. So look out for that on the shelf as well. You don't have to buy every single book. I'm a big advocate uh, for public libraries. As a matter of fact, most of the books behind me and in my hand are from the public library. So today we're going to look at 19 of her 65 books. And what you will see is the experiences, the struggles, her heritage, her life, just based on the little snapshot that I'm going to share with you. And again, I hope that you look at, I will be featuring many of her books on uh, my website, literarylymyway.com. But I also will be sh sharing her on, the, on one of the very next ones as the author. So let's talk about some of the things that are here. Okay, I'm going to start with Junkyard, uh, well, I start with this one. 
This is Fire Talking, and this is her early years. It's an autobiography. Uh, so it takes her up into, um, it takes her through her childhood. It shares all of that with you. Um, it tells you what she does. Like she's a public speaker. She goes to about 200 different uh, schools or groups every year and speaks and presents. Sometimes they're schools, sometimes they're libraries, sometimes they are um, parents, educators. Wherever a group wants her to come in and talk and is willing to uh, bring her there, invite her and take care of whatever the logistics are, she goes. And it also talks about her writing process and how what she does. Basically when she gets up, she says in every single room she has one or two uh, rocking chairs. She loves rockers. And then she'll sit in there when she gets up and gets her morning coffee and everything. Then she sits down and she starts jotting or writing. She sticks with the book until she finishes it and then she moves on. So she'll start jotting and writing and getting her thoughts together. And then she gets up and she goes and jogs or runs. One of the reasons she started running is because her son is diabetic. And when they discovered that and he had to get more exercise, she ran with him to encourage him and to support him. And she just continued, even though they're now grown and out of the house. After that, she goes back to the house and she gets back into the routine. She takes care of phone calls, emails, all of those kinds of things. And then she starts working on whatever book or illustration, because as I said, she's an author illustrator. So all the books that I get behind me were illustrated by her. And all but one was written by her. The only one not written by her was Casey at the Bat. And of course, Casey at the Bat is the Ballad of the Republic sung in the year 1888. But in this version, she does the artwork. She is the illustrator. But the other 19 books are her works. And so I want to share some of those with you, if you don't mind, to give you a little glimpse of who Patricia Palacco is and what you're going to find out about her. In Junkyard Wonders, and that's the one I'm going to start off with, Junkyard Wonders, it takes her through some of her struggles. Uh, one of the things that I did not mention earlier is that Patricia Palacco did not write her first book until she was 41 years old, 1987. Before that, when she was a little girl, she was excited as little children are, ready to go to school, as most little children are. She got to school, she couldn't wait to learn. And the one thing she wanted to learn, her big, big thing that she wanted to learn was how to read. Her uncle always told her, her family told her that reading was like honey. They even poured the honey on um, to a book to say how to sweep, how you sap it up and the whole bit. But she, she wanted to learn to read. When she got to school, it wasn't as easy as she thought. She had difficulty. When it came time for her to read, she could not get the words out. She struggled so deep. She was a very much a struggling reader. And the kids made fun of her. They bullied her to the point where she didn't even want to go to school anymore. And so her parents had divorced by the time um, this story came about. Her dad lived in Michigan. She had already moved to with her mother to um, California. And what she wanted to do was stay with her father because she spent summers with her father. She wanted to stay with her father this summer so she can go to school. And her reason for that is because the year before when she was living with her mother and her grandmother, Babushka, when she was living with her, with them, um, a couple of things took place. And one of the things was that she was put in a class for special needs or for learning disabilities. And she thought that if she could get a new start she wouldn't be bullied, she could learn to read, she could be happy. And I know you know many kids like this, or have heard of many kids like this in today's times, and it's very sad. Well, the parents agreed, and she stayed with her dad. And when she stayed with her dad, and went to school, ready for that fresh start, well, children don't think about things like transcripts follow you, and records, and all those things. She was put, as you can guess, into a special needs class a class with children that were having difficulty learning. And the thing on top of that is that the class was called the junkyard because the kids were so different, just like things in a junkyard, just 
here and there pieces that don't match anything. And that's what they were called. But by the time that year was over, under the guidance of the teacher, Mrs. Peterson, they became wonders. And they referred to themselves as the junkyard wonders. And I'm going to tell you what the teacher said to them on that first day. I'm going to read just that part if you don't mind. What that teacher, when she came in, room 206, she said she'll always remember. The teacher said, as she threw a thesaurus down on the table, excuse me, an enormous dictionary, um, and she said, the definition of genius, and this is one of my favorites, genius is neither learned nor acquired. It is knowing without experience. It is risking without fear of failure. It is perception without touch. It is understanding without research. It is certainty without proof. It is ability without practice. It is invention without limitations. It is imaginations beyond or without um, boundaries. It is creativity without constraints. It is extra ordinary intelligence. So can you imagine children that feel discarded or feel like that they can't learn and they're different? A teacher coming in and telling them those words? Well, you're right. It stimulated them. It stimulated and got them going. So they went to become, they on to become wonders. And I'll share that at the end when I close, what they've been doing. The next one I'm going to do is thank you, Mr. Falker. Mr. Falker was her fifth grade teacher. And as I already mentioned to you, Patricia had trouble reading. No one knew why. Most, some of the teachers just sat her over to the side, didn't pay a lot of attention. As I said, the kids were laughing. When she got to fifth grade, she met Mr. Falker. Mr. Falker found out that she was dyslexic. And he made it a goal to make sure to help her learn to read. And she was, she was ecstatic. I don't, I don't know another word to say right now, but she was ecstatic. Before, her artistic talent had started coming out because when she couldn't read, she would just go into her little shell and she would draw. And then she became known because of her drawing. The, her drawings were posted in classrooms. She was a great illustrator even in those days. Of, as being a child, but once she learned to read, she didn't lose her passion for illustrating. She added that to her passion for reading, and she couldn't wait to celebrate with her honey. In an A for Miss Keller, Killer Keller is how she was known, and Killer Keller did not give A's. Have any, I bet some of you have had teachers like that. I do not give A's. And you have to impress me to get that, and I don't get that. Well, she had to write. It was a writing class. And she was selected. It's much like an honors class. Everyone can't take that class. Well, her writing had got her to that point, where she had reached that point. But Miss Keller was a tough cookie. And when she turned her papers in, she was so proud, they kept coming back with grades that were not acceptable to Patricia. And then at one point she was talking to Pops. He's a man in the community. And she was telling Pop, and Pop kind of basically told her, stay with it. She's a great teacher. My kids have it. She's tough. And that's how she learned that the nickname was um, Killer Keller. Well, Pop later passes on. And assignment was due the day that he did. And she didn't have the assignment to turn it because she could. Just, she just kind of hit her mental or, or writer's block, and she just knew she was about to flunk. And then that note told her that he had passed on. She needed to go to the office. Her mother was there. They went home, and she found out that he truly had passed. And then what she did is she sat down and wrote and wrote and wrote. Her emotions just flow. Well, long after the papers were due, when she finished writing the paper, completed it and it was to met her satisfaction, she turned it in. And when she turned it in, she didn't think it was going to be graded. But later when she went back to class, uh, 
it was there. And the teacher gave, came when she walked in, gave her a hug, and then said, I broke my own rule, basically. You earned an A. And so it's a movie story. What the teachers told her is that she found her emotion and her passion. And she could see the emotion and the passion, even though there were some things that still needed to be corrected and need to be worked on, that it was the emotion and that passion came through because of the feelings that she had. Her true feelings went out on the paper. And it was about pop. In uh, Mr. Wayne's masterpiece, that's where she gets over her fear of public speaking or speaking in front of a group. And it was because of the drama teacher, okay, uh, Mr. Wayne. In that one, it's, it's one where she, now you can see where she's connected her reading to her writing to her speaking and the impact that it's made, these tributes. She also had a, uh, a few other books that are not on the shelf uh, about educators. Mr. Lincoln's Way is one, where she talks about a principal who uh, basically encounters one of the children in his school who is very much, um, is very prejudiced to the point of possibly being racist. Um, calling his names, he was also a big bully. Pushing kids, etc. And Mr. Uh, Lincoln finds a way to reach the student through a book, but also through an activity that connected him to the community and to what the boy was good at and what the boy to his interest. So it wasn't just about the math and the social studies and the science. It is what's going to inspire this boy. How is he going to be motivated? What will motivate him? And then putting those pieces together. And after he did that, one thing you need to know is the bullying stopped. Um, the environment changed. And that was one of the things he found that sometimes the influences at home and this boy had lived with his grandfather and then with his father, but wanted to go back with his grandfather, how those influences might, um, might uh, kind of make a child behave in a certain way. So again, that's another good one. And that, that boy is now a teacher. Okay, another one that I wanted to look at is Bully down in this corner. Bully is one that talks about um, two students who were friends from day one. But a popular group came and invited the young lady to be part of their group. And when she did, then, she, you know, she thought that's what she wanted to be. But they no longer wanted her to speak to her friend that she had known and felt. And like I said, from day one, they became best of friends. And to the point that they wanted her to mistreat, she knew right from wrong. She decided that that group was not the right group for her. And so they, of course, felt like they needed to retaliate. They were hurt. They were embarrassed. And they felt disrespected. So while she went to a funeral, they posted um, test things, an answers, and the way we cheating, and made it come from her. And that's what they told everyone, is that it was her. So when she got back, of course she was in trouble with the school. But that best friend stood by her, even though she had treated the best friend not so well for a period of time. And what happened is, that person did the investigation, shared the research, shared the results, and it ended up um, showing that she was innocent. Okay, the Blessing Cup is one of those that deals with tradition. And it deals with heritage. And that one takes place in Russia. And after leaving Russia, when the Tsar's, um, Tsar, um, soldiers um, made her great-great-grandmother leave Russia. They were only able to take a few things with them, and one of the things was a cup that they, a, a tea set that they um, had. And that tea set was split among the children along the way. And so by the time uh, Patricia got it, there was just one cup. And that cup one day fell and broke. And it was a cup that you used ceremoniously at different um, events. It was a blessings. To thank people, to thank um, 
to give thanks for the blessing and to ask for blessings and to share blessings where it broke. First, she was just upset. But then what took place is she realized it had broken in half during that storm when it hit the floor. She has two children. She realized that the blessing in the breaking in half of the cup was so that she could pass on the tradition or, the, if you will, this piece of their history, even if it's only half and they can no longer drink from it, onto her children. And my old man, he kind of takes it through the trip. And I told you that uh, she often, or oh, she in the summertime, went to spend with her, with her father in Michigan. That is what that story is about. She shares those experiences, the fun they had, the things they did, the sacrifices he made. And when lightning comes in a jar, that one is a family reunion. And the lightning in the jar are those lightning bugs, those fireflies that at night come out and look like they're raising and it just looks like a lot of lights, much like the stars in the sky. And she talks about how if you put it in a jar, it's like it w you're hopefully you're inspiring these children that were doing it at the time to continue their lighting of their culture and of their traditions and passing them on each year to their own children. Okay, in Lemonade Club, that one's her daughter. Uh, she includes a daughter in that one where she talks about her daughter's best friend ended up being very sick with cancer. They started a Lemonade Club, basically making lemonade out of lemons. And the class, including the teachers, shaved their heads. And um, to, to help this child go through the struggles that the child was going through. And at the end, when everybody's hair was growing back, the teacher still was wearing her cap. They learned that the teacher was also, and also had cancer. And so that rally of the kids, that connection that they all had, and how they utilized that connect connection to engage their friendships, but also to educate. And what takes place in the Lemonade Club at the end, you find out that um, one becomes a doctor, the friend is a teacher, and well, one's in the medical field, the other one's a teacher, and then you have another one that's a researcher, and another one that's um, the teacher is a, um, a, a professor at a university in the area of medical sciences. In Mermaid's Purse, this child loved books, collected books, found books, wherever she could get a book, she had to have it. But the book was serving the community. It was there for her own, but she, she would collect any book, even if it was not of interest. But one basis, she created her own library. Okay, that's basically what she did. And she made sure that people, at first they laughed at her and they couldn't understand what she was doing. If she learned that someone wanted to build a fence but they weren't sure that, how to do it, she would find the book or try to find a book that had that information and share it. Well, along comes a tornado, rips up their house, rips up a shed that her father had built for her. One of the things I have on my list, on my bucket list, I would like, a, instead of a she shed, a book shed, if you will or book cave, whatever you want to call it. But regardless, it, all the books, everything disappeared. The shelves, everything was torn. All her books went everywhere. And the community came together because by now they realized the value that she has um, and the treasure she has that is the community's treasure. And they, um, they rebuilt this bookshare, this library, which was called Mermaid's uh, Purse. And once they've done that, she was a little still upset because what, why have a shed if there were no books? But then one of her best friends shows her that and points out that coming down the road in whatever kind of vehicle or whatever way they could transport it in hand, whatever, the community had branched out, much like a GoFundMe page, see what I mean, connections, had branched out and found, tried to find all the books and brought the books back. Some of them were in great shape, some of them not so much. Some of them were, had been wet, and they had strung them up on their clothesline until they dried out, but they were bringing the books back. Okay, Holes in the Sky is when, um, the second time that we meet Miss Eula, we meet Miss Eula in another book called Chicken Sunday. Um, when, they moved to, uh, when they moved to California, 
it was shortly after Babushka, her grandmother, had died. And her grandmother always talked about the holes in the sky. And when you die, that's where you go. So she was already grieving and feeling bad. And if she lost her grandmother, what was she going to do? Well, Miss Eula became her second grandmother, if you will. And she helped her in this book. She helped her through the grieving process. Well, they were still friends, and the boy, Stu, is her best friend. And while in Chicken Sunday, you find out how they became those friends. And one of the things you that it was that little white red-headed child started going to church with Miss Eula and the grand um, and Miss Eula's grandson, Black Church, lively Black Church. And so that cultural piece, it just shows you how, how you can love, respect, uh, sometimes uh, be tolerant or appreciate things because she fell in love with the church, she fell in love with the world, she fell in love with the people. And the grandmother was very big in the community, so that became a piece as well. Gifts of the Heart talks about gifts are not always have to be from a store. It's a hard thing for, sometimes for our children to learn. Um, but that sometimes the gift of the heart or from the heart is the most important gift, the most valued gift, the most appreciated gift. And so it, it takes you through the travel of what were the gifts of the heart in this book and why it's important. And Thunder Kate, Thunder Kate shares with you her fear um, of storms, of thunderstorms. And Babushka would always... Um, kind of lighten it up, if you will, get the opposite side, that it can be a fun thing, even though it's a scary thing. And so before a storm actually reached, when it first started, or they know about it, they would gather from whatever part, kind of like a scavenger hunt, they would gather the things needed to bake a thunder cake. And you had to do it, if to make it work right, you had to do everything before the thunder actually arrived, or excuse me, before the storm actually arrived. And so in thunder cake, that's what happens. It became a tradition, and she still has that tradition. Matter of fact, in this book, she shares the recipe for thunder cake. And again, it's another tradition that was passed on, but it helped relieve her of anxiety that she had because of storms. And Fiona's lace, Fiona's lace, um, again goes back to her, um, to her Irish side, and it talks about. The lace that was made in Ireland, and when they had to leave, when they left Ireland, that they also um, still passed on again of tradition and family, passed on to younger people, other generations, how to make the lace. And Fiona was one of those people to, which, uh, to whom the tradition was passed on, and she used it and took it very, uh, was very proud of it. Made money for the family, helped sustain the family. Well, a big fire breaks out, and when that fire breaks out, people have get out of the way, move, be relocated, etc. And she got separated from her family, but she still had when she had grabbed her um, her lace, some of her lace, and the lace was, of course, ashy and dusty and wet because of the fire and putting out the fire. But what she decided to do is um, she went and tied lace around uh, things. And that's how the family found her. They followed the lace, much like Hansel and Gretel. And with Shanka's eggs, this shows uh, the uh, Russian side, uh, Ukrainian side, of where Babushka used to paint those beautiful eggs, um, Ukrainian eggs, and what happens to the eggs, and the beauty that came out of the catastrophe that took place. And the butterfly, we talk. Uh, that one has to do with um, the Nazis and um, and the French. And so they basically, the little girl wakes up to find what she thought was a ghost on the side of her bed, but it's not a ghost. It's a little girl that her mother had been hiding with her family in the basement, a little Jewish girl. And needless to say, they became friends. And she would bring things to her dirt from the outside so she could feel the soil, etc., food. Um, and then one day she brought in a butterfly. And the little girl begged, let's, let's let it loose. Let's let it have its freedom. And you can see the symbolic um, rationale behind that. 
or they let it go. Shortly afterwards, the family was discovered, and the, these families had to move and leave. And so she, um, one day, they didn't know what had happened to anyone. A butterfly flew in. A few more butterflies flew in. A lot more butterflies flew in, and they took it as a sign. And they later learned that the little girl that had been in the basement was free and living in another country although her parents did perish um, with that situation, with that Holocaust. Um, in our mother's house, our mother's house is one of those that sometimes in some states or school systems it might be on the ban list. It's a family, as you can tell, a multicultural family with two mothers. And it talks about the love and these children would not have had that love had these ladies not taken care of them. And it says that, you know, basically the differences are also similarities because they were like any other children on the street. People came over, um, they talked, they played, they did everything. Other parents did, even though there were two ladies. Uh, but there was one family that uh, judged them and was very rude with them. Uh, didn't want the kids to play with them, etc. And so they t this book kind of goes through the feelings that were, ha were happening and also what took place at the end that brought um, people together, if you will, um, and helped learn a little about tolerance. They don't always have to be acceptance, but at least the tolerance and the respect and that that needs to still be there. And so that's what this one is about. And um, this one right here is um, The Love of Autumn. And The Love of Autumn is a love story. How this little kitty brought someone together through its little mishaps and whatever took place with him. And I think that's, those are the ones that I have for you today. There are some other ones that I love. Um, Pink and Say, Civil War, Black Boy, White Boy, both fighting uh, for the cause became friends, ended up having to hide out, if you will, um, and what happened to them at the end. Uh, there's another one that's called Just In Time, Abraham Lincoln. That one is kind of a time travel of reenactment, if you will, where, they, where the children end up going back in time and learning what it was like when Abraham Lincoln was alive and what it was like um, historically. And, and what took place and what they would have expected. Uh, let's see which other ones I'm trying to think. As I said, there's a lot of them, and uh, there's 65, and as I said, the new one's coming out. But what I wanted to say is 